Everyone on the internet and every guitar teacher you ever met probably told you to practice arpeggios. But I remember spending hours practicing arpeggios and not being able to do anything with them. Being able to play them doesn't mean that you get them to sound great in your solos. It feels like you might be wasting your time. Luckily, that isn't too difficult to fix and I'm going to show you seven ways that you can turn any arpeggio into a solid jazz line. It's pretty simple and really more about how you think about arpeggios. You can build all of this around a single exercise because when you're starting out with jazz, then there is actually a right and a wrong way to practice arpeggios. And I would also suggest that you skip inversions for now, but I'll explain why that is later. In jazz, you mostly use arpeggios that are one octave. So it doesn't make a ton of sense to spend a lot of time practicing complete positions. Instead, you'll be more efficient practicing them in a scale as diatonic arpeggios. That is the way you will hear them used in jazz solos and it's also a great way to connect them to the scale and the other notes that they work together with. It covers a lot of stuff that you will need along the way. I learned this exercise from Barry Harris and that is one of the most practical things to get right in the beginning. The focus is on turning these arpeggios into music and I'm gonna show you how you add phrasing, notes and rhythm to them because that's how they become jazz lines. But first, let's just keep it really simple and just improvise with the arpeggio because that's going to teach you some other important things as well. Let's say that you want to solo over a 2 5 one in C major. So D minor 7 to G7 to C major 7. You need those arpeggios to play a solo over the progression and luckily you already practiced them in the exercise. So the first chord is D minor 7, that's the second degree in the scale. So then you get G7, that's the fifth. And finally C major 7 and here you can use this one. And you can practice these in time over the progression just to connect it to the music as well. The first thing to do to practice soloing with this is to just play rubato and compose some lines, try to use some different rhythms. It's going to be something like this, but try to notice how I'm also really careful in getting from one chord to the next. And then after some time you develop better rhythmical ideas and melodies and you can start playing lines in time. This is great for nailing the changes and developing some solid rhythms in your playing, but let's open up the arpeggio with a few extra notes. That's where it starts to get really fun. That first exercise I gave you connects the arpeggios and the scale, so if you look at a C major 7 arpeggio, then you want to see that in the scale, so these notes are around it and you can use those when you're improvising. That could give you something like this. Or use a descending version of the arpeggio, something like this. Super easy, barely an inconvenience. It's mostly about seeing the notes around the arpeggio and using them to move to a note within the arpeggio. In these two lines, that's really how I think about the notes, something around the arpeggio. Let's add some notes that are a bit more exciting. I'm of course talking about adding chromatic passing notes since you already have the diatonic notes from the scale. You can do a lot with chromatic passing notes and there are systems that help you with that, but for now, essentially, you can do whatever you want as long as you resolve it to a chord tone. That's what I'm doing here. Check this out. And I'm really just adding a chromatic note in front of some of the chord tones, so like this before the E and before the B. And just mixing chromatic and diatonic notes with the arpeggio can give you this. When you practice this, then work on composing lines and find the things that you like the sound of. One thing that can make them sound more like jazz is by having the high note of the phrase on an offbeat, similar to what you heard in the last example with the B on the one end. There is a way to make it easier to do that in your jazz lines, and that is the next level. But keep in mind that you can actually go through this video and just pick one of the topics to explore, write some lines and work on getting that into your playing. It doesn't have to be in this order. Instead of adding a single note here and there, then you can also add small melodies that move to a chord tone from above and below. These are called enclosures. Let me show you how they work, and then we can add some rhythm to the arpeggios. A simple example of an enclosure could be a diatonic note above, so if I want to hit the G, that's my chord tone, then a diatonic note above would be A, and a chromatic note below, which could be then F sharp, and that would give you... For all the notes in the C major 7 arpeggio, that would give you this.
Remember that you're still seeing the C major 7 arpeggio in the scale as well. And now you can create something like this and try to compare how far this is from just playing the arpeggio. And it's incredibly simple to create some solid vocabulary. Here's one with an enclosure around the root and around the fifth. Let's try some more interesting rhythms. There is one way of playing arpeggios that is pretty much instant bebop. When you hear it, I'm sure you'll recognize it. So I'm playing the arpeggio as an eighth note triplet and I'm adding a leading note before the first note. Now check out how this sounds when you add a few enclosures. Or this example, which is one of George Benson's favorite licks. He probably learned it from Charlie Parker. Now, I said that inversions are not so useful for jazz lines. Let me show you what you can do instead, and then I'm going to show you some phrasing tricks. Similar to the triplet, then this is a really great technique for making your lines sound better and not be too predictable. It can easily get boring if you're playing just up and down the scale all the time. Now, I mentioned in the beginning of this video that inversions are not super useful for jazz, and this is mostly just by looking at the solos that I've come across and transcribed and realizing that there are not a lot of seven chord inversions in there. They're mostly just root position arpeggios. Now, when it comes to triads, then that's a different story. There are triad inversions all over the place, but that's for another video. Instead of the seventh chord inversions, then this is a much nicer, much more melodic option, the pivot arpeggio. What I'm doing here is that I take the arpeggio, so C major seven, and then I'm playing the first note, the root, but then I move the rest of it down an octave, so... And that gives me sort of the same order of notes, but I also get this large interval that sounds really good and it still has a natural flow. And if I add some enclosures to that, then I get something like this. And you can of course use this on the higher octave as well. But one thing is changing the melody and the rhythm. You can also tweak the way that you play the notes on the instrument the phrasing. Let's start by sliding into a note. Here it's the top note of the phrase. But you can also add a slide later as well. Another useful tool for phrasing is adding trills like this one, which sounds great in a line if you do this. The important thing is that you pay attention when you listen to great solos and then recognize how they use these things. That way you get inspired and can build your vocabulary with material that really sounds like jazz. One player that really demonstrates these techniques incredibly well is Joe Pass. And you can hear pretty much all of this in this jazz blues solo, which you anyway want to check out because it's a perfect jazz blues. 